1941. Moved to Kunming along the Burma Road. There, 
Chennault set up a fighter control headquarters and hooked into an elaborate air warning network of Chinese aircraft spotters. The Japanese, based 60 miles away in Hanoi, headed for Kunming to destroy the Tigers. flight was airborne. Word was being flashed to Chenault and the Flying Tigers that they would soon be under attack. Isolated spotters used lanterns on hilltops to pass the signal along. This was the decisive moment. We weren't going to lose any planes on the ground. Kung Min wasn't going to be in either Pearl Harbor or Clark Field.
nauseating at full throttle, the tow planes could barely lift their ton and a half cabooses. They labored hundreds of miles until, over the drop zone, the glider pilots cut their ships loose. Banking sharply, the unarmed gliders avoided enemy fire by diving for the ground. As more cut loose and headed down to the spinning earth, the glider army joined the paratroopers. Thus, the AAF gave the infantry wings, and the weapon, vertical envelopment, became a reality. Whatever the capability of fighters in the field, there is no hope for victory without a steady supply of men and machines. At the time, America had the best commercial air transportation in the world. Almost immediately after the outbreak of World War II, the War Department contracted with airlines to ferry men and supplies quickly across the ocean. The ferry service was reorganized as the Air Transport Command under veteran flyer General Harold George. By summer, ATC routes touched all six continents. The growth of the Air Transport Command closely paralleled the expansion of the Air Force itself. In less than two years, sky bridges connected practically every corner of the world. ATC sky wagons guided by the Army Airways communication system crossed the Pacific on the average of one every hour and a half, the Atlantic every 13 minutes. We needed a break. The Philippines had fallen. Americans had been humiliated and tortured on Bataan. The Nazis were running wild all over Europe and North Africa. We needed something to give a boost to the folks back home. A submarine officer proposed a plan to strike back at the Japanese, and Colonel Jimmy Doolittle was handed the task of figuring out if it could be done. Doolittle figured and said it could. It was an idea so daring, so beyond anything anyone had tried before, that the Army took it to the White House for approval. The President listened quietly, thought about what was being proposed, and gave a one-word answer. Go. It had never been done before. Launching fully loaded medium bombers from the deck of an aircraft carrier. It was the intent of the Doolittle Raiders to launch an attack on Tokyo. The 16 B-25s on the aircraft carrier Hornet had a rough voyage on their way to the takeoff point, 450 miles from Japan. While under destroyer escort, the 80 Tokyo Raiders held a deck ceremony with Japanese medals. Doolittle fastened one of these to a 500-pound bomb. The medals were going to be returned with interest. Before reaching their takeoff spot, the task force ran into a Japanese ship. escort promptly sank the patrol boat, but there was no way of knowing whether it had radioed the American fleet's existence to other vessels. Since secrecy had been compromised, Doolittle ordered the planes to be launched. They were nearly 700 miles from Tokyo, instead of the planned 450. As they prepared for takeoff, the Raiders knew even their heavily modified bombers didn't have the range to return to the carrier. In spite of the last second change, Preparations went just as we'd rehearsed. Doolittle had only 467 feet of clear deck for his takeoff. Behind him, the rest barely had room to rev up, and the last plane hung precariously out over the stern of the Hornet. After the wind up by the plane officer, Doolittle made his run. Tension eased a little once the colonel was in the air. Crewmen cheered as one plane after another left the pitching deck. were 
are flying practically unarmed to lighten the load and give them extra range. When the decks of the flagship were cleared, Admiral Bull Halsey, the flag officer of the task force, signaled to the Tokyo Raiders, good luck and God bless you. The Japanese patrol had indeed warned the city, but the attack was expected the next day. The Japanese assumed the Americans would wait until the carrier was within safe round-trip distance for its airplanes. The bombers were virtually unopposed as they swept in over the coast on their way to Tokyo. Elements separated, and some climbed to 1,500 feet for the bombing. Doolittle's planes appeared over Tokyo. The city had just completed an air raid drill. At 12.15, the attack was opened by Doolittle, who dove in before he dropped his payload. One after another, they checked off their targets. Tank factories, shipyard docks, railroad yards, steel plants, gunpowder factories. The Raiders were only over Tokyo for six minutes but they left a broad trail of flame and smoke in their wake. The military effect of the raid was minimal. The physical damage repaired in a few days. But Japan had had its first taste of war on its own soil, and it rattled them. They were no longer immune to the war they had started. They were no longer immortal. something to cheer about back home. We Army Air Force Flyers had done the job, but we didn't get much of a chance to be heroes. All of us Doolittle Raiders crash landed in China. Most of us made it back to fight again. Doolittle himself returned and promised that our raid was just an omen of the eventual destruction to be heaped on Japan from the skies. During the critical early days of World War II, the Navy broke the Japanese secret code. The intelligence that code provided proved invaluable throughout the war, but never more than it did on May 15, 1942. On that day, Navy intelligence officers intercepted the detailed Japanese plan to attack Midway Island in the North Pacific, as well as points in the Aleutians off the coast of Alaska. There was no way to tell if the Japanese knew their code had been broken. If they did, the whole transmission could have been nothing but a setup. That would be the end of the already tattered U.S. Pacific Fleet. But if the transmission was legitimate, if the Japanese really were planning a move in the North Pacific, heading off that attack could be a turning point in the war. The Army and Navy decided to gamble, to try and intercept the Japanese fleet at Midway. The Air Transport Command delivered reinforcements, bombs and ammunition to the Aleutians, and B-17s to Midway. We knew every last plane would be needed for the battle. After the long flight to Midway, with no rest, our crews went immediately on patrol. A Navy Catalina spotted the Japanese fleet, more than 80 warships, as advertised. The coded message was authentic, and we knew we were in for a fight. The Japanese task force divided. Some steamed north toward Alaska. But the main body headed for Midway. 470 miles west of the island, the battle stage was set. The B-17s and B-26s sent to the island were fitted with extra gas tanks to increase their range. This was going to be the first test of B-17s as a defensive weapon against attacking surface forces. The battle started on the 4th of June. Nine B-17 
the enemy sought to cut Europe's Lend-Lease lifeline. They hunted in wolf packs, teaming up against even the most protected convoys. In the first half of 1942, enemy subs sank 506 Allied ships. Confronted with what was clearly a desperate emergency, the U.S. Navy called on the Army Air Forces to assist in the fight. Our long-range B-24s were the answer. We'd get out in front of the convoys, crisscrossing the ocean in search of subs. When we saw them, we went after them with depth bombs. They started crash diving when we flew over. We managed to sink a few, and it wasn't long before the Germans started looking for us instead of the convoys. Our exploding bombs helped clear the North Atlantic of the Nazi U-boat threat. June 1942, New York Harbor. Men of the 8th Air Force, 10,000 strong, prepared to board a single converted luxury liner for England, just as their fathers did a generation before in the AEF Aero Squadrons. The Royal Air Force, which had fought brilliantly in the Battle of Britain, set out to teach the Americans, and the Americans set out to learn. As well as the English and Americans got along at ground level, in the command post there was a basic disagreement on tactics. The AAF came over prepared for daylight precision bombing. The British, who had suffered catastrophic losses on day raids over occupied Europe, preferred bombing under the cover of darkness. Accordingly, the British Bomber Command picked their targets, trained their crews, fed them lots of carrots, and designed their planes for deadly night attacks. Our first test came August 17th. We loaded up for the first all-American bombing raid over Europe. The target was the Great Railroad Marshalling Yard near Rouen in Nazi-occupied France. The Brits were plenty skeptical. The Nazi gunners were battle hard, and our morale had worn pretty thin from repeated dry runs and impatience for action. The guys played nonchalant, but we knew what was riding on this mission. We were out to prove the effectiveness of daylight high altitude precision bombing. <laughs> Maybe we didn't know any better, but we had plenty of confidence. Confidence enough that at the controls of one of the lead ships was the old man himself, General Aker, flying a B-17 named Yankee Doodle. The city of Rouen. More than five centuries before, Joan of Arc had died there fighting for the liberation of France. Now a bunch of American kids in airplanes with names like Baby Doll and Peggy D were about to do the same. We made a direct run for a point about three miles north of Rouen, and then a slight turn to starboard for the bombing approach. Visibility was excellent. All of us flying this first U.S. bomber raid wondered why the sky was clear of enemy fighters and flag. Turns out we'd taken the spotters by surprise. They were expecting only night attacks. Our 12 planes dropped a total of 37,000 pounds of bombs. Then the flat came up to meet us. Daylight gave the Germans better targets too. And 
British Bomber Command, Air Chief Marshal Harris sent General Laker enthusiastic congratulations. Any Katoodle, he said, certainly went to town and can stick another well-deserved feather in his cap. November 8, 1942, the Mediterranean. Eleven months after Pearl Harbor, more than 800 ships engaged in Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa. The plan called for tactical air support for the ground forces. Some of the air units were ferried to England from the States by aircraft carriers. Now inspired by Doolittle's Tokyo raid, land-trained fighter pilots, because their planes were urgently needed, risked the carrier takeoffs to get to Morocco. We had 70 P-40 Warhawks on the U.S. flat top. 25 more on a British carrier. We liked this plane. It was both a fighter and a bomber, and could carry a 500-pound bomb as easily as it could a belly gas tank. At two and three minute intervals, we raced down the short deck and grabbed for air. Felt like somebody pulled the runway out from under us awfully fast. We cleared the decks and buzzed the carriers for luck. Then the entire group headed for the already battle-scarred landing fields of French Morocco. Allied forces had rolled over the opposition and moved halfway across North Africa only to grind to a halt because of weather and lack of supplies. The Allies were almost within sight of the enemy's big supply forts in Tunisia. However, logistics and mud dictated the decision. At General Eisenhower's order, the attack was postponed indefinitely. The mountains, the roads, even the air seemed to ooze from six weeks of steady rain. Nothing moved on the roads. On the temporary airfields, wheels went no place. Only a few meager supplies trickled through. For once, like the foot soldier, air support, the umbrella for our ground forces, was stuck in the mud. The enemy was in much better shape. They had hundreds of planes operating from permanent all-weather fields. Their veteran, battle-trained Luftwaffe was sure of easy victory over crippled American air units. Allied harbors and airfields were primary targets. Air defenses were weak, open to enemy dive bombing and strafing. Air Force bomber boys who had started in the muddy fields of Algeria. 
They were teamed up with 9th Air Force men who had eaten sand all the way from Egypt, 1,500 miles. Before 9 o'clock, we had planned to fly more than 1,000 sorties. Anything that could take off, did. The Irons were anxious for the air attack, which would mean a breakthrough. They didn't have long to wait. Resistance began to crack. In two hours, tanks and infantry had advanced as much as a mile. Crusade for Freedom and now had a new champion, Allied Air Power. The Allies took a quarter of a million prisoners. In the German defeat, we learned the strength of joint unified command of the troops on the ground, coordinating with the planes in the air. Allied Air Power had destroyed enemy planes, guns, and ships, and that paved the way for the final destruction of the opposing forces on the ground. Get out. 
action lie ahead of us. Our guns were going to be especially important today. Fighters could take us about halfway, but they didn't have the range to follow us all the way in. Eighth air support mediums bombed diversionary targets. But for the worst part of the trip, we'd be on our own. Soon, 30 tons of bombs, planes, and men lifted off. The leader of the first wing swept in a huge circle around the field. into position. By the time the flying fortresses got into formation over the British field, they were picked up by German radar. Luftwaffe experts plotted the American course, altitude, and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately, a dozen Nazi airdromes from Denmark in the north to Paris in the south began to send up everything they had. June, 
three days before D-Day, enemy strength in Holland, Belgium, and France had been increased to 60 divisions. German headquarters knew an invasion was coming, but it wasn't sure where. Thinking the Allies intended to strike directly across the channel's narrowest point, the Nazis poured their limited resources into the Pontypridd coast. Late on the afternoon before D-Day, Eisenhower, Spatz, and Brierden came to the headquarters of the 101st Airborne Division. They visited with paratroopers who were about to be dropped in France. Soon after, a special broadcast brought all the mass military forces the final word. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. The tide has turned. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. This was really it. Here we were, vaulting the channel. One British and two American divisions. Our mission, to drop troops behind German lines and create a two-front war. Those paratroopers were tough young men making, making history of their own. History which some of them would never get a chance to read. Fighters. The Nazis knew how important Ploestes oil was. They 
weren't going to lose it easily. Yeah, 
shifted to ground attack. Backed up by the bombers, the steady pounding whittled away 90% of Romanian oil production. We heard them, but they heard us too. And we wondered about our missing air crews. How many would come back? came sooner than we had expected. Twelve days after the last bombing of Ploesti, we got a real thrill. Romania had surrendered to the Russians, and word went out that the Bratz was organizing an airlift to bring back the flyers who'd been shot down and lived. In just three days, more than 1,100 returned. The Bratz called it Operation Reunion. It was the first mass prisoners of war operation. But to us, it seemed like hundreds of our bodies had been brought back from the dead. General Twining made sure the men got medical care and some hot food. And then he bid them Godspeed on their next mission. Their new checkpoint was the Statue of Liberty. Their target was home.